Bom dia para todos. Good morning, good afternoon, Franco. É um prazer estar aqui com vocês. Hoje nós recebemos o professor Franco Moretti. Eu vou fazer uma brevíssima apresentação dele, que me parece, inclusive, desnecessária, na medida em que o Franco é um velho amigo nosso, é, com uma história de colaboração com a USP, é, mas há duas ou três coisinhas que eu quero dizer a respeito do Franco, para aqueles que o estão uh, encontrando pela primeira vez. É, o, prof, o professor Franco Moretti é um, é um emérito da Universidade de Stanford, Stanford University, e lá nessa, na universidade ele foi fundador do Center for the Study of the North, são do Laboratório de Estudos do Romance aqui, é, aqui, aqui na USP. Eu brinquei com ele que eu ia roubar a ideia dele, que me pareceu uma, enfim, uma, uma possibilidade né, de criar um espaço para discutir o romance é, inestimável. Bom, é, o professor Franco tem alguns livros traduzidos para o português, eu vou usar um item uma série de publicações, eu vou me referir apenas aos livros que foram traduzidos para o português, uh, não necessariamente na ordem de publicação, uh, mas o Atlas do Romance Europeu, Signos e Estilos da Modernidade, O Burguês, A Literatura Vista de Longe, Romance de Formação e uh, um, o primeiro volume de uma coleção de cinco volumes que ele editou, que tem como tema o romance. Né, são cinco volumes diferentes, infelizmente, é, quatro, uh, uh, os, os quatro uh, volumes não, não estão disponíveis em português, mas o primeiro volume foi uh, publicado também. E, então, eu não vou uh, me estender mais. Now I'm going to uh, say hello to Franco again, because I'm sorry I had to sort of uh, make an introduction in Portuguese. That's why, but I mean, I'm sure you could understand part of it. And uh, so I'll pass on uh, the floor to you, okay? Ah, let me just say something. Eu vou só fazer mais um comentário. Vocês vão estranhar que hoje o professor Franco vai falar sobre tragédia e não sobre romance. E, é, mas ele prometeu que no segundo semestre ele vai estar de novo conosco fazendo uma outra apresentação sobre uma pesquisa mais recente dele sobre os best-sellers perdidos, The Lost Best Sellers, é, que é um trabalho que ele está uh, produzindo agora. Então, without further ado, Franco, on to you. Thanks very, very much for being with us and for accepting to uh, share your presentation, your ideas with us. No, no, I am the one who thank you, Sandra, uh, and all of you who are listening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening uh, to a talk that uh, is not on the topic on which you are working right now. But as Sandra said, I promise I will I will be back and talk about novels. Uh, promise. In a few, I, I, I first have to 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 write the piece. I. Yeah, um, so recently I've been working uh, less on novels and more uh, on uh, drama. And uh, this talk today, uh, which maybe you can see now the opening page of the PowerPoint, the title Murder by Words, it comes from Hölderlin, the German poet, um, uh, thinker, playwright. And uh, he, in his notes to Antigone, he writes at a certain point that uh, the Greek tragic word is uh, death bringing. Um, he loved these contractions and uh, he said, you know, the, um, speech in, uh, in Greek drama brings death, uh, leads to an actual murder by words, uh, which is what I use for the time. What does he mean uh, by that? Well, um, it can mean more than one thing. In Antigone, it means something quite straightforward. At a certain point, the king of Thebes, and I will return to this later, more than one thing. In Antigone, it means something uh, straightforward. Uh, 
at a certain point, the king of Thebes, and I will return to this later. There is there is a strange echo here. Can you? At a certain point. Is it okay with you guys? Can you hear well? Because I hear a, a, an echo if I stop. Is it okay for you? I I can see you nodding like it's okay. Yes, so it's, I go okay. On. it's okay. It's okay. Good. Yeah, go. I think it's go. sorted out now. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks. Um, so, uh, Creon at a certain point gives an order to bury Antigone alive. And uh, this order, these words, the words literally kill Antigone. Uh, in other cases, it's a little more indirect. Uh, in Othello, Iago cannot order Othello to kill Desdemona, but he manages to persuade him to do so by leading him to believe into uh, an adultery that has never occurred. So there are many strategies, but they all have in common this fact, which is, I think, one of the most important aspects of tragedy, that uh, a, a painful, harrowing, very often unjust death is accompanied and often prompted, motivated, caused by incredibly beautiful words. This, this is the striking thing, a horrible death and beautiful words. So uh, why does this happen? Why can words kill as they do in tragedy? What does it mean? This is what I'm uh, I'll try to uh, talk about today. They kill because they're caught uh, in a conflict which is radicalized quite quickly and indeed leads to death. Um, not all tragedies uh, um, are like that. Not all tragedies end in death. Uh, not all theorists of tragedy say that conflict is the center of tragedy. So I'm only talking about a, a, a subset of the big genre we call tragedy. I think it's the most important uh, part of tragedy, but um, the thinker that uh, uh, created, established the link between conflict and tragedy was Hegel. And if the next slide can be shown in the lectures on aesthetics, he speaks of dramatic action rests entirely on collisions of circumstances, passions, and characters. What we see in front of us are specific aims individualized in living characters and conflicting situations. Conflicting situations. So this is the core of tragedy. But conflict of what kind? Well, here, as you can imagine, I mean, since one speaks of conflict to death, it's inevitable, or at least it was inevitable for me to start thinking about war. And by uh, coincidence, but quite uh, uh, an interesting coincidence, the first tragedy whose text we have in full, which is Aeschylus Persians, Persians from the beginning of the fifth century uh, BC, is indeed uh, about uh, one of the most famous battles of uh, European history, the Battle of uh, Salamis. But by the time the play opens, the battle, the war, is actually already over. There is a messenger who arrives and tells the story of the Battle of Salamis to the Persian court, but the tragedy lies not in the battle, but in what follows it. Agamemnon, another great play by Aeschylus, it begins with an incredible scene of a watchman a guard alone at night on the roof of the royal palace. He has to be there like a dog, he says. He's, uh, he's been uh, terrified. He cannot fall asleep because there is a sign that he must be able to see the very moment that the sign appears. It's a flame, fire in the night, and uh, the, flame, the, the fire appears. It's on Mount Ida and then on uh, Lemnos and then on Mount Athos. It comes closer and closer to Argos where the scene is set. It's a sign, it's the sign that Troy has fallen and in fact is burning in the night as we know. Uh, so the Greeks are coming home. The war is over. The war of classical antiquity, the Trojan War. The war is over and tragedy is about to begin. Antigone, the first uh, uh, choral ode that the chorus sings after five or 10 minutes of the play, beam of the sun, fairer than all that have shone before, 
for seven gated tables. Finally, you have appeared, eye of golden day. Finally, the night is over. The attack against the city has been rejected. Uh, the seven have lost. Um, and uh, uh, the war is over. And tragedy has already begun. Hamlet, he begins also at night with soldiers on top of the castle. They're talking about recent wars. They're worrying about uh, current uh, preparations. And uh, as they're talking, a ghost appears dressed for war in, uh, in an armor. Uh, but in the next scene, the king sends an embassy to Norway and uh, the war is avoided. There's an army that passes through the stage, but it's going elsewhere. The war is near tragedy, but not in tragedy. So it's a, such a recurrent pattern, it's quite uh, striking. This war that is and is not there. Why? Uh, I think it has to be there. The reason war is so indispensable to tragedy is that, by definition, war destroys the conventions of uh, peaceful uh, admin, uh, uh, time and therefore unleashes the kind of violence that is necessary for tragedy to occur. Uh, I'm thinking here, for instance, of the, the beginning of Macbeth. Uh, it has a double beginning. It's a strange play. It has a double beginning. First, a scene with the witches, and then the battle which reveals Macbeth's homicidal fury. The two beginnings, but really they're the same thing. War is what liberates the witches. What was dark, what was unthinkable, can come out into the open. So war is there, is near the uh, tragic plot. Uh, it's, it's a trigger for tragedy, but almost never the center of tragedy. And the reason for that is that war is usually waged against uh, an external enemy. The Persians, the Turks, the Protestants, the enemies of Brandenburg, whatever, but it's an external enemy. Tragedy is interested in conflict with an internal enemy. Civil war, much more than uh, war as such. The war within the family, as the Greek, uh, as the French classicist Nicole Leroux has called it in uh, one of her beautiful essays. Uh, the Seven Against Thebes, indeed. Uh, um, Eteocles and Polynices, the two brothers who kill each other in front of their city. King Lear's daughters, Neron and Britannicus in Racine, Karl Moore and Franz Moore in uh, Schiller. There is a long uh, series of these fratricidal plays. And then, of course, there is the Oedipo uh, thread. Oedipus itself, Electra, Orestes, Hamlet, Sigismundo, uh, Don Carlos. Uh, uh, it's, uh, there is plenty of uh, those two. Uh, we shouldn't be seeing that uh, uh, diagram yet, uh, if it can go back. But there is no harm in having it there. I, I will get there uh, in a little while. So, um, civil war as the sort of horizon of tragedy. Uh, I say horizon because um, in the theater, everything has to be stylized, right? Uh, we only have a handful of characters. So the war within the family, not really the war within the state. But in this reduction, in this stylization, a couple of elements are preserved that are typical of civil war. These are elements I draw from the work of an Italian historian of civil wars, of the Spanish civil war, but then of civil wars more generally, Gabriele Ranzato. Uh, he points out, and first is the um, impossibility of neutrality in civil war. Of course, in most civil wars, the, the majority of the population is, is indeed actually neutral. Not in all, but in most of them, uh, you know, the, the 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 mass in the middle is larger than the active uh, forces that fight each other. The point is that to this neutral mass, the fighters usually uh, don't recognize any legitimacy. They want them to take sides, and if they don't, they are they they. The Despise them and try to make them for sight. And the same happens actually in tragedy. 
In tragedy, tragedy is the form in which neutrality is impossible. Take Hamlet. Hamlet is a play with a large group of characters. The two antagonists are clear. It's Hamlet and the king. Almost all the other characters are neutral, more or less, between them. Only one of them takes sides, Laertes, who sides with the king. But all the characters who are near Hamlet and the king, they all get killed. Um, neutral characters, even before Laertes, that's Polonius first, and then Ophelia, and then Rosencrantz, and then Gildersen, and then Gertrude, and then uh, ultimately Laertes, and the two enemies are the last ones to, to die. So, rejection of neutrality, and then second uh, trait in common between tragedy and uh, civil war, there is a death which is not just uh, often unfair, and it's not just only death, but it's usually accompanied by torture, mutilation, uh, rape, incest, cannibalism. It's really a gallery of horrors. And uh, um, Ranzato often says, it is hard to explain the incredible, the cloud of hatred, he calls it, that surrounds civil wars much more than uh, other kinds of war and cannot be explained with any it's, it's as if something that has its roots in a dark past as very often is the case in tragedy that you know the current events have their roots back in the past it's especially true for greek tragedy uh, where the lineage is very important but it has never completely ceased to be all right so um tragedy and conflict conflict, uh, tragic conflict as somehow modeled or a stilization of civil war. I always speak of tragedy in the singular, but how can one actually speak of a genre which has uh, on and off been active for 25 centuries, uh, dozens of incredible masterpieces, often very different among themselves, um, how can one speak of that in half an hour, you know, a little more, 45 minutes, like I will today? And you know, one uh, way of doing so is what uh, uh, Shklovsky suggested in, uh, uh, in the theory of prose, uh, not about tragedy, about novels, but the principle is the same. At a certain point, he says, Tristram Shandy is the most typical novel of universal literature. So you understand Tristram Shandy, you understand every novel. One could do the same uh, for tragedy and look for the tragedy that, so to speak, the tragedy of tragedies that summarizes them all. Hamlet is very often a candidate for this uh, uh, role. But um, but I actually think uh, Shklovsky was wrong here. And so instead of trying to look for the center of the genre of tragedy, I'll do exactly the opposite. I will look for two extreme cases. Um, two tragedies that don't resemble each other at all, like often happens with extreme cases. Extreme cases are interesting for me because in them, the forces that surround a given form acquire a particularly clear form. And so that's what I'm going to try to do. So the first extreme case is Antigone. And here, if we could go to that, uh, to um, slide number three with the first quote from Antigone would be great. Um, the attack of the seven against Thebes has perfect, has been uh, rejected. Eteocles and Polynakis are dead. Creon, who is the interim sovereign of uh, uh, Thebes, has uh, made a decree and uh, uh, this decree establishes that Eteocles, who has defended the city, will be buried with all honors. Polynices, who's led the enemy army, will be left unburied, prey to birds, dogs, animals, etc. Et Antigone, who is Polynices' sister, in secret buries, buries him. She's discovered, she's brought in front of Creon. Do you admit you have done this, or do you deny it? I say that I did it, and I do not deny it. And did you know of the edict that prohibited it? I knew. How could I not? It was clear. Now, a lot has been said about the values that Creon and Antigone embody here. Fundamentally, 
political autocracy and family piety. And I will say something about that later, but for but you know, for now, I don't want to talk so much about the uh, about what they say, but about how they say. So dramatic dialogue, uh, like indeed these uh, lines uh, you see here. And uh, you know, to us nowadays, if we go to the theater, dialogue seems natural, but actually it's not the way tragedy began. If we can go to the next slide, the diagram, um, when tragedy began, uh, the space of dialogue was relatively uh, uh, reduced in, uh, when slide number four at a certain point will appear on the screen, you will see it is a chart that indicates the percentage <clears throat> of tragic language that was assigned to the messenger and the chorus. And messengers and chorus are not really involved in dramatic dialogue. Yes, the messenger speaks to someone, but it basically reports what has happened off scene. And the chorus mostly sings and dances. Every now and then uh, is engaged in dialogue, but in a very spe special way. And so, um, as that chart uh, shows, at the beginning, um, messengers and chorus together um, had uh, um, about half of the words uttered in a play. So dialogue only accounted for about half of the play. But then very quickly in the space of uh, one generation, really two at most, uh, um, uh, the situation changes and you can see it now. And uh, the space, uh, uh, the word space, so to speak, occupied by messengers and girls declines uh, to around 20% or even less, which means that 80% of more of the play becomes dialogue. So dialogue is not how tragedy started, but it is indeed um, the form towards which tragedy developed very quickly. And it's, uh, it's rare to see a form change its nature as quickly as we can in this, uh, in this diagram. And the reason for that, I think, is that whatever its origin were, um, tragedy evolved rapidly towards dialogue because dialogue is where conflict and language meet. In dialogue, conflict is not something that is being talked about. It is the way people talk. Conflict is no longer content but form. Alles ist Rede gegen Rede. Everything is speech against speech wrote uh, Hölderlin again about uh, Oedipus and Hegel. And here, if we can go to number to slide number five with the other uh, Hegel quotation from the aesthetics, the completely dramatic form is the dialogue. For in it alone can the individual agent express, individual agents express face to face the ethically justified pathos which they assert against one another in solid and cultivated objective language. So imagine this, a conflict to death, which is expressed face to face, gegenein under, it's an adverb, uh, literally one against the other that Hegel uses often when, uh, when he discusses issues like this. Um, to a conflict to death expressed face to face by antagonists, who are given equally valid reasons. This capacity, this Greek capacity to have enemies speak to each other is really, to me, incredible. Uh, the first tragedy is Persians, as I told you. Well, in Persians, there isn't a single Greek. It's being staged in Athens, but all the characters are the enemies of Greece who wanted to destroy Greece and almost succeeded to destroy. Now, what allowed, what made it possible then, this capacity to have enemies speak eloquently, as Hegel says, and to listen to the enemy while in the middle of a very tense conflict, what made it so, I won't say easy, but possible then, 
and so unimaginable for us today. Imagine the Persians today. No one can do it. This is really, I think, the central crux of what one could call the political anthropology of tragedy. Unfortunately, I, I see the problem, I see the question. I really have no idea what the answer would be. So, you know, I'm, well, hopefully I will find it. And if I don't find it, I don't find it. So back to the conflict in Antigone. Um, Creon is a, a sovereign, a man, an adult in power, surrounded by guards. Excellent. Thanks for the, for the slide. Um, and uh, Antigone, uh, a young woman alone. She's of the royal lineage, yes, but the disproportion between the two of them is uh, evident. Dialogue balances this disproportion. It is really form as a counterpoint to power. Stichomitia, this is the technical term the Greeks had, which is exactly what you see on your screen. So one verse each. Oedipus supposedly is about almost 50% in Stichomitia. Um, this is a way to, um, to, to balance power. Do you admit you've done this or do you deny it? I say, I did it. I do not deny it. And did you know that of the edict that prohibited it? I knew. How could I not? It was clear. How could I not? It was clear. See, it's also this absolute clarity that makes words kill in tragedy. They burn all the bridges. They, uh, people hate clarity and are afraid of it, uh, wrote uh, the young Lukacs in the metaphysics of tragedy. And as we'll see in a minute, even in tragedy, uh, clarity is not always uh, there, but in Antigone is absolutely unmistakable, right? Words burn the bridges. Words are as sharp as in this case as acts. And uh, as you were in this exchange, they are indeed devoted to reflecting on an act, what has been done. To do, to act, uh, deed, action, this is a, a very important semantic field in uh, Antigone. When uh, the guard uh, uh, first comes into uh, onto the stage, uh, Antigone, uh, I mean, the corpse of Polynices has been discovered, buried, but no one knows who's done it. And the guard, the first words uh, the guard says is, I'm not the one who did the deed. Then after, when Antigone is discovered, he drags her on stage. This is the one who did the deed. So, you know, it's the deed, the act is key. And uh, as I said, the clash here is between state and family. It is plausible to think, well, what Antigone does is what any family member would. This is what Hegel wrote about uh, uh, her actions in the aesthetics, in the phenomenology of the spirit, uh, elsewhere. So he called it an immediate ethical action. Ethical, yes, but immediate. So that did not require reflection. But actually, this is not true. Um, because you see, Polynices doesn't have one sister. He has, he had two sisters, Antigone and Ismene. And the first scene of the tragedy, literally the opening of the tragedy, is the two sisters. And the first line of the tragedy is a line that talks about the fact that they're being sisters. When Hölderlin translated Antigone, he created an incredible, he uh, loved forging this, an incredible German word, gemeinsam schwesterliches, um, common bond of our being sisters together as if to emphasize that, you know, the two are one. But Ismene doesn't want to do what Antigone does. She refuses to bury Polynices. She even tries to convince Antigone not to do it. So in other words, Antigone's act is not an immediate ethical action. It's actually a choice. It's a decision. 
And so as there is no doubt about it, Sophocles has Antigone bury Polynices twice. She buries him a first time, uh, the corpse is discovered and it is uh, uh, left unburied again. She buries it again and this time, the second time, she is caught. And uh, it's important, um, repetition uh, is frequent in tragedy and it makes sense because, I mean, Sigismundo in Life is a Dream dreams twice that he is uh, uh, free and Herod in Herod and Marianna sentences Marianna to death twice. And the reason tragic form uses repetition is that through repetition, accidents are eliminated. Tragedy doesn't want to have to do with accidental pain. He wants decisions. If we can have, yeah, exactly this uh, next uh, stage, uh, um, you have perhaps stop, stop, Herod, says Marianne at a certain point in her uh, great uh, 19th century tragedy. You have perhaps this very instant your fate in your hands and can direct it wheresoever you please. The moment comes for every human being when our star's charioteer hands over to us the reign of fate, this only is awful, that we don't know that moment. Well, Antigone knows that moment exactly. She does what she wants to do at exactly the right moment. She does it, she does it twice. Not only that, she says that she has done it. I say I did it and I do not deny it. And she had already announced it to his, to his men before uh, actually burying Polynankis. And you see, uh, moving the action into the sphere of language is not only another form of repetition, which it certainly is, it also means language makes actions explicit. It makes them public. It's a way of acknowledging them. The underworld and those who live there know to whom the act belongs. This is Antigone again. It's fantastic formulation for this unity of action and actor. Tragic life is the kind of life which can be summarized in a single act of an entire existence, writes Lukacs in the Metaphysics of Tragedy. And uh, Antigone is indeed the perfect example. Okay, opposite extreme case, Macbeth. Banquet, Macbeth. Uh, Macbeth is surrounded by other uh, Scottish nobles. He's the king now. He's about to sit down and then Banco's ghost appears. Sorry, the next line I don't have in the slides, but I'll tell you, you cannot say I did it. I say I did it, Antigone. You cannot say I did it, Macbeth. Earlier, Macbeth has just killed Duncan and uh, uh, he walks back onto the stage and his wife realizes that he's still carrying the dagger uh, full of blood with which he has killed the king. And so she says, go back, leave the, the dagger there and smear with blood the two guards that we will then accuse of the murder. And this is what Macbeth replies, I'll go no more. I am afraid to think what I have done. Look on it again, I dare not. I am afraid to think. Not, not just to say, even to think. So instead of uh, being brought into the sphere of language and therefore being brought into the open, what Macbeth has done is, as one of the witches will mumble at a certain point, is a deed without a name, an act that cannot be said. But like many of the things that cannot be said, the act is always also there. It tries to be uttered all the time. If we can go to the next uh, slide, this is uh, the beginning of the scene at the end of which Macbeth will murder Duncan. And it's a beginning and it's a very uh, short uh, um, 
line and a half. If it were done when it is done, then it were well, it were done quickly. Here it is, excellent. So you see, the future murder is everywhere here. Uh, if you show this, uh, the next slide, you will see that uh, it is the subject of each of these sentences, but it's always hidden. It's concealed in that microscopic word, it. If it were done, what? The, the assassin, if it were done, when it is done, then it were well, it were done quickly. So it's everywhere, but it's everywhere concealed. The neuter pronoun, as if to distance it as much as possible from what is human. And then again, nothing has been really acted yet. Nothing has happened. And yet the verb to do, if we can go exactly to this, uh, the verb to do is there already in the past participle, as if everything had happened already. And, you know, even um, um, phonically, it, it, it sounds like a death knell, down, 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 again, three times in a line and a half. And then finally, the next slide, if, you, if one looks at the uh, modes, you know, subjunctive, indicative, conditional, subjunctive again. Well, these are the modes that demarcate the real from the possible. Here, they're so jumbled together in such a small space. Really, it's as if the difference between real and real and uh, merely possible had been abolished. And we, you know, we have the 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 earth is shaking under our feet as uh, as if. Oh, and all this in three seconds. It takes three seconds to read these. Uh, uh, these words. There's, and, and the rhythm. These are 13 monosyllables. It can't get quicker than that. And the only word which is a little longer and slower is the last one. That quickly, it, it has two syllables, but of course it is semantically another acceleration. And then the real change of place. If, next slides. If it were done when it is done, then it were well, it were done quickly. If the assassination, here it comes out and you know, it's like a bomb. I mean, it's, you know, this word which is half a line long. It's a sort of moral enormity turned into sound, does it? Why have I insisted so much on these two lines? Well, first of all, because they're fantastic, but because theory, theories of tragedy always have um, a certain difficulty in explaining the pleasure we take in watching tragedies. There's such horrible stories. Why do we like them? What I just presented here suggests a possible answer. We don't like the what, we like the how. We like the linguistic creativity, the imagination, the poetry that goes along. Again, remember what I said at the beginning, the, the crux of tragedy is horrible actions surrounded by incredible language. What can we do with language? What can Shakespeare at least uh, do with language? And I think this is uh, um, fundamentally true. Uh, uh, you know, we like tragedies uh, uh, to a large extent because of their incredible linguistic creativity. I've devoted my life to the novel, but there's no comparison to how uh, great tragic language. I mean, the novel, I mean, who remembers sentences from novels? Yeah, a few here and there, but you know, tragic, tragic language is truly memorable. Okay, it's truly memorable, but there are also, there is um, um, some problem because you see, if it were done when it is done, then it were well, it were done quickly. First time you hear it, it's not that easy to understand. And uh, a couple of scenes earlier, Lady Macbeth is uh, uh, musing on her husband's personality. And if we can have that, uh, um, thou wouldst have great glamis, that which cries, thus thou, thus thou must do if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do than wishes should be undone. Imagine this at the theater. It's hard enough reading. Imagine at the theater where words vanish after a second. Hegel's theory of tragedy 
tragedy as conflict required as a sort of presupposition the absolute clarity of tragic language. Passages like this, many passages in Shakespeare, show how incredibly opaque, beautiful, yes, but opaque tragic language can be. Why? Let me take a step back here and, uh, you know, because, um, yes, there is a lot of poetry in Shakespeare, but the poetry is not distributed uh, uh, evenly everywhere. It is usually concentrated in uh, the soliloquies of his main characters. And uh, this choice destroys the balance that had been established by um, tragic dialogue. If we can go to the next two Histograms, these are two um, charts. Again, one is made from Antigone, and it shows you, uh, here it is, how many words the various characters speak. And as you can see, Creon speaks more than the chorus, uh, who speaks uh, more than Antigone, but still the characters speak a, 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 a comparable amount of words. If we now go to the next slide, which is the same principle, here is Macbeth. And as you can see, there is Macbeth speaks three times as much as the next character, who is his wife. So the two of them together speak about. And then there is a long tail, an interminable tale to the right of the image. I'm not even sure that they're all here, the characters. Anyway, there are in the play 24 characters who taken together speak less than half of what Macbeth by himself speaks. So uh, in the transition from one dramatic distribution to the other, from the word space of the police to the word space of the court, one could say, generalizing politically. Well, um, what I described as Sophocles' counterpoint to power becomes something completely different. It's uh, a sort of superhuman ruler. We, Macbeth, in this case, who is made even more charismatic by the extraordinary poetry he utters. So in this new situation, there is, as it were, a sort of a dark fascination with power. Dark in more ways than one. One, because it's a fascination with, uh, with this murderer who, incidentally, he also finds himself caught in repetition. He kills Duncan, but then he realizes he has to kill again and he has to kill again, and he has to kill again. And at a certain point, he even says, you know, this is, uh, you know, at this point, I may as well continue killing because there is no way back. And in, in a sense, uh, perhaps the second killing, that of Banco, his only friend, is even more important in this respect than the first one. There too, the repetition is uh, at work. So, a dark fascination, I said, with uh, power. Dark, not only because of the nature of power, but also because of the opacity of language. If we can go to the next slide, this is Macbeth trying to understand why, or perhaps even whether he wants to kill Duncan. I have no spur to prick the size of my intent, but only vault in ambition, which overleaps itself and falls on the other. Enter Lady Macbeth. How now? What news? So one, uh, the intent is a horse, ambition is a knight, Macbeth is a sort of centaur. Yeah, one more or less one understands here, but really only more or less. And then is ambition a knight that vaults or a spur that pricks? And who is it that falls in the fourth line of this passage? Is it the ambition knight, or is it the intent horse? And since both ambition and uh, intent are so clumsy and so weak, why proceed at all? Why does Macbeth kill Duncan? In the end, we will never know. And this is not an explanation. And in fact, with true dramatic genius, and he, he does it in other plays also, Shakespeare interrupts a soliloquy that he cannot really solve logically by having another character come in. Once Lady Macbeth comes in, we would never know 
why Macbeth wants to kill Dante. And it's not just Macbeth. Next slide, Othello, completely different play. Othello, it's he's entering Desdemona's bedroom. He's about to murder her. These are the first lines, he says. It is the cause, it is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chase stars. It is the cause. Well, what is the cause? For some interpreters, the cause is uh, does the monarch supposed adultery. For others, no, it's not that. It's the desire to avoid other uh, adulteries in the future. For others, it's still another thing. That is to say, the desire to save Desdemona's soul in the other world. And this is already not very solid ground, but then you look at the passage and say, wait a second, what really seems to torment Othello here is not what Desdemona supposedly has done, but the mere existence of a cause in human existence. And uh, now, um, causality is an important force in tragedy. Uh, especially in, you know, causality, the, the chain of causes that, uh, uh, the, especially in Greece, again, the great tragic cycles that can never end because one thing generates another. Causality is a force, especially perhaps in this tragedy where Iago causes Othello to move almost like a puppet, whereas what causes Iago to move, we never know. So, there is, a, um, uh, there is a depth, clearly, in, this, uh, in these words, but they're also very arcane, very unfathomable uh, in one way. Um, it is often said that Verdi's uh, uh, Othello is uh, uh, more logical than Shakespeare, and I think it's uh, right, because Verdi, the librettist, gave Iago an aria, Credo in un Dio crudele, and this aria explains why Iago does what he does. Yeah, but the point is Shakespeare is Shakespeare because he doesn't explain, because he doesn't add the aria. So again, why? What does it mean that there is this opacity in language? Last point, in five minutes it will be over, and uh, it... Uh, um, it has to do with uh, another playwright who would have been the Shakespeare, I think, of our democratic age, except that he died of typhus at 24, uh, Georg Büchner. And in his uh, Danton's death, which is the one great, great tragedy about a revolution, language acquires an incredible power. This is Saint-Just at the command. We will conclude simply and quickly. Since everyone was created under the same conditions, no one may enjoy privileges, neither individual nor larger classes. Each part of this proposition in realizing itself has killed its human beings. The 14th of July, the 10th of August, the 31st of May are its punctuation marks. Each part of this proposition has killed its human beings. Murder by words, here it is. Jacobinism, uh, writes uh, François Furet in uh, Pensée, La Révolution Française, Jacobinism radicalized uh, the, rev the revolution but by making it coincide with its discourse and then brought to power the purest instance of such discourse, Robespierre and Saint-Just, exactly this. And you see here, Saint-Just, who is arguing for Danton's death, here, he, he still believes he's in control of uh, language, but a later scene shows the other side of the story. If we can go to the last slide, this is Danton and his group have been led to the conciergerie, to jail, and there, there is another prisoner who greets them. And uh, the slide is not still, uh, is not there yet. I will start uh, reading and, and I'm sure it will appear, the galleries applaud and the Romans, here it is, the galleries applaud and the Romans rub their hands, but they don't hear that each of these words is the death rattle of a victim. 
Try following your rhetoric to the point where it becomes flesh and blood. Look around you. All this you have spoken. Here is a visual translation of your words. These wretches, their hangmen, the guillotine, are your speeches come to life. All this you have spoken. As this language as all powerful and yet completely out of control, alienated. And this reaches its apex. These are the great declarations, incredibly clear. This reaches its apex in two parallel scenes, two night scenes, the two great antagonists, Robespierre and Danton. Uh, because you see, this is the great play about a revolution, yes, but it's not, the conflict is not between revolution and ancien regime. It is within the revolution itself. Very interesting thing in, to which I cannot go uh, today. So, two night scenes. First, Danton at the window cannot sleep. Macbeth shall sleep no more. Macbeth has murdered sleep. He cannot sleep because he goes to the window, he hears words. September, who cried this word? As I came to the window, something shrieked and cried in all the streets. September. September is uh, September of 1792. It's the month when the massacre of the prisoners, the aristocratic prisoners in Paris prisons occurred. Danton was Minister of Justice. Um, he did not instigate the massacre, apparently, but he let it, allowed it to happen. Uh, as he speaks, his wife uh, wakes up. You're dreaming, Danton. He was just a child crying in the night. You are trembling, Danton. What does this word want from me? Why does it stretch its bloody hands towards me? Words kill, and therefore they have blood on their hands. It's the same Robespierre, also alone, also at night, also at the window, looking out into the world. Why, cannot, why can't I get rid of this thought? With its bloody finger, keeps pointing towards the same spot. His thoughts are not really his thoughts anymore. I cannot tell which part of me is trying to deceive the other. And he, un he ends up repeating at the end of the scene the same words of the archetypal tarrant of German theater, uh, Philip in Schiller's Don Carlos, Ich bin allein, I am alone. We're all crazy, says Danton at a certain point. There are several scenes of madness in the play. There will be even more scenes of madness uh, a couple of years later in his next play, Wojciech. We're all puppets, Danton again, moved around by unknown forces. What appear to be most manifest, this is Hannah Arendt uh, um, on the French Revolution, was that none of its actors could control the course of events. That this course took a direction that had little or nothing to do with their willful aims and purposes. And the result of all this was a feeling of awe and wonder at the power of history itself. Awe and wonder. This is almost an echo of Aristotle's pity and terror in uh, the poetics. And you see, if a historical event had the potential to, so to speak, revive the type of conflict of Antigone, well, the French Revolution must have been it. And Buchner, who co-authored a subversive pamphlet, who slept with a, uh, with a ladder hanging out of his window because he was afraid of the police coming to arrest him, who, with Wojciech, wrote the first uh, workers' play in history, um, Buchner was really uh, perfect for this task. But in his most inspired moments, his revolutionaries speak like the great tyrants of Renaissance plays, especially like Macbeth, uh, in fact. 
And indeed, again, like Macbeth, they feel that what they've done is also a crime. I felt Republican virtue tremble in the depth of my hair, in, of my heart, wrote Robespierre, the real Robespierre, not the one in the play, to his uh, brother, um, when uh, he uh, witnessed the fate of Louis, uh, Louis the Sixteenth. So Buchner's linguistic intensity and Shakespeare's before him sort of capture this disorientation, this awe and wonder at the power of something that is outside human beings themselves. They capture this. They, in fact, they even intensify it. They intensify this uh, um, uh, enormity of historical ruptures. They do so by turning it, however, into an enigma. Antigone's clarity was a sign of mastery. She did exactly what she wanted to do, perfectly aware of what the consequences would be. Uh, Buchner's and Shakespeare's uh, metaphors with their incredible, breathtaking, really, intensity, raise the emotional temperature, they instigate action, but as a leap into the dark. They're great poetry, yes. They're poetry that blinds. Poetry that blinds or antagonistic clarity? What do we want? What do we want? What do you want? Thank you very much. Wow. What an ending. What a conclusion. <laughs> and I suppose that uh, we don't have an answer for that, do we? Can we choose? Do we have to choose? <laughs> not really, not really. But, you but know. maybe, you know, um, I might say on, 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 you know, just on, on the, um, on the, on the spur of the moment, I would say poetry that blinds. <laughs> and on the spur of the moment, I would say Antigone, but I changed my mind 10 times every day. So. <laughs> Great. No, it's been great. Thank you very much for such a beautiful, beautiful presentation. This, uh, and you know, I'm really impressed uh, with the with the your ability, your capacity to get so much from you know the words themselves. I mean, it's, it's from the language. It's amazing, and I think that this is a very, very um, let's say breathtaking <laughs> example. Uh, to our students uh, of how to do textual analysis and how to get so much from it, really. Thanks very much. I'm, I, 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 I'm really, really happy that you have decided to talk about tragedy to us. So we can forget about the baggy, loose, mo <laughs> loose baggy monsters for a while. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Now, um, You're welcome. I, uh, well, lots of comments here, which uh, you, you unfortunately do not have, uh, you, you cannot see, but um, uh, lots of comments complimenting you. Uh, thank you. The words are outstanding, amazing. Thanks. Great lecture. Thanks, Franco. You see, they are on a first name basis already. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then... Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see. Uh, there's a question here which uh, has been actually uh, made uh, in English, so I'll just read it. Uh, the, uh, the, the the person who asks it, I don't know if it's a student or a colleague, um, I'm not familiar with her. Francisca asks, and she also uses Franco, <laughs> first name basis in all We have the English. same name. We have the same name. So, you know. Yes, that's right. Uh, you said that clarity of words is what kills in tragedy. But now, in these examples, and I'm not sure which examples she's referring to it specifically because you've given examples from several plays, and this was uh, the question was made 
I don't know, a while ago. So let's, I'll, I'll do it again. Franco, you said that the clarity of words is what kills in tragedy. But now in these examples, the clarity seems to be concealed by language. Yet murder happens. I was not able to grasp that. So I think no, no, it's a perfectly good question, Francisca. And uh, um, the, what I said, clarity kills and actually also obscurity kills. I mean, there are these are two different types of tragedy. I did not want to mean that only clarity because it was clear killed. These are really two different tragic structures. In one case, death follows from the absolute acknowledgement of the existing conflict. In the other, it follows from the dark um, impulse that leads to act. There are just two, as I said, I was going to work on two uh, extreme cases, and they lead to death in opposite she's ways. Think she's, she says here she's referring to, to Shakespeare? I assume so. So oh. I, I assume so. I don't know uh, that uh, uh, you know there are there are two different uh, there are many different ways of uh, leading to death in tragedy. But today, when I was uh, you know uh, dealing with a specific relationship between language and conflict, I would say that you know that we move from one extreme, which is absolute clarity, to the extreme of absolute opacity, and they're both equally. Uh, uh, tragic, let's say. And powerful. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, at the end, you touch that after. Ah, okay. <laughs> she says, oh, there's a comment from Francisco. She said, at the end, you touched uh, on that, and after I had asked the question, I understand now. Ah. <laughs> I think I think she she asked the question and then you you went on uh, uh, sort of uh, developing your argument and then uh, I think it became clear to her. Um, and then she understood that there was a problem that had not been solved yet. Yes, yes, I, I suppose so. The, 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 blah, 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 let me see if there's any other question here. Well, there was a question here. Wait, a, wait a moment. Where's that? Ah, yeah. Uh, Oh, uh, so it's a it's a question that was actually asked in Portuguese, and then I'll see if I can translate that into English. Let's say, uh, well, the question refers to the moment after the rise of the bourgeois drama. Uh, I think it's a reference to Diderot here, and um, bourgeois life as uh, as a topic. So, um, how uh, how do you see the effectivity? I would say, perhaps, uh, which is how I can translate the word "atualidade" uh, from the nineteenth century onwards of the idea of the tragic conflict. Well, um, this is a classic question of the history of tragedy. Uh -huh. uh, one of the great books written uh, on it uh, in the last uh, half century was Steiner's Death of Tragedy, that basically is on the impossibility of tragedy after uh, the great generation of German playwrights ending more or less with Büchner. And um, yes, I so think. Are there we, are... Sorry, let me just complete here because there's, there's been a, a sort of. Uh... Yeah. A, a sort of footnote. Peter Zondia uh, argues that tragedy has no place in the bourgeois, bourgeois world. So, that, that I mean, this is what I think the question is referring to. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's totally true. And uh, um, this has been a problem. And uh, um, sorry, I have to do something... Uh, this is the comic uh, subplot uh, uh, of many Shakespeare tragedies. I have to get up and let back in the cat, which you cannot hear it, but he's banging <laughs> against the window. Okay. And I'll be back in 30 seconds. That's fine. Go take care of the cat. <laughs> yeah. uh, Done. Done. 
that, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was, but <laughs> uh, it's about to. It's beginning to rain outside, so it was oh, very okay, was, uh, <laughs> yeah, annoying. Yeah, it doesn't get. To the <laughs> and, and he could see me. He could see me through the window and, and did not understand why. It was getting desperate. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So. Uh, indeed, uh, tragedy is difficult uh, uh, within bourgeois life. I think for a variety of reasons, I will try to summarize the two or three that seem most important to me and others. The first is the in tragedy has always been a, the, the, the social dimension of tragedy has been a public one. Uh, with the, in uh, in in the bourgeois world, the private dimension grows enormously, and the drama itself ends up being, and it becomes by far the most significant aspect of life. And uh, drama, uh, tragic drama, specific comedy is fine, but tragic drama uh, finds it difficult to uh, exist only within the private sphere. Um, the greatest, uh, the greatest of uh, uh, bourgeois dramatists, uh, Ibsen, uh, has uh, returned to this over and over again. He has come up with uh, some uh, great solution. It is uh, striking that his greatest tragedies are, uh, in fact, usually considered to be, and in my opinion, are tragic comedies. So there is always that kind of dissonant feeling, the wild duck, and the doubler, so on. Um, he also, he, he, he actually wrote a play which is often seen as the modern Antigone, A Doll's House. A Doll's House uh, does not end with the death. Um, and, you know, all of this is, is, is one aspect of the story. Can there be a tragedy of private life and not of public life? Second point, uh, this private life has been represented with enormous success, not by, not on the stage, but in the pages of books by the genre of the novel. And so tragedy in the 19th century is a form that finds itself to try and compete with another form that is becoming more and more successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also does not make things easier for, uh, for again, Ibsen comes to mind. Uh, his uh, plays develop out of and against a kind of conversation which is typical of uh, of novels, really, sort of uh, aimless, meandering, etc. Et then the third point, but this is something I still need to study and work on, um, there has actually been, uh, uh, tragedy has been written, especially in uh, Africa in the course of the 20th century, and there it has again encountered elements like myth and indeed public and political uh, life, different from the ones we're used to. And so uh, in a sense, there has been a revival of tragedy, but outside of the realm to which we are used. So this would be my, my uh, answers to that. Uh, Uh, there are two more questions here, which uh, also refer to your presentation. But can I just ask you something about you? You mentioned the novel uh, very in passing here, but you know it's interesting to think that in, in in England, particularly, I mean, if we think about the English novel, referring to the English, uh, the, not uh, British, yeah. uh, it's interesting to think that you know you don't have that many tragic plots. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's not really something that you find uh, frequently, and um, yeah. I know I know you, you, you well, but this 
probably should be something we could discuss later on about the lost bestsellers and all that. But I mean, uh, this is something that always strikes me as um, a curiosity, a problem, a question, you know. So, yeah, no, I agree. More more frequent in, in, in France, let's say, than in England. It seems that there's, a, concilia there's a conciliation uh, there, there, there's a tendency towards conciliation in the in, in English novel that you don't find in in, in the French one, and therefore yeah. uh, that's why it seems to me that Thomas Hardy is such a you know uh, 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 an exception to the rule. And uh, anyways, just just a sort of footnote. But uh, yeah. two questions. Oh, sorry. I agree. I agree. I agree with you. That's all. Okay. Okay. No. Two more questions here. I think, yeah. No, I think there are some more. Wait, I think I think I'm missing some. Uh, so there's a question uh, uh, by Alini. She asks, "What does the failure of Tiresias' sacrifice have to do with Polynices and Antigone?" Again? No, I understood, but um, the failure of Tiresias' sacrifice. Yes. Um, there is no uh, sacrifice of Tiresias. I mean, uh, Tiresias uh, comes into um, the play, into Antigone, and tells Creon not to uh, put Antigone to death. And uh, uh, then Creon finally accepts the idea, but it's too late. So, um, but so I'm not sure what, uh, what the question is. If the question is, uh, has to do with this fact that, you know, the Antigone's death could have been avoided had Creon changed his mind a little earlier. Um, yes, but uh, this doesn't, in my opinion, change the tragic nature of the plot. I mean, um, uh, it is wrong to identify tragic death with a death that is inevitable. This is not the case. It's a death that is decided upon. That is, uh, uh, and uh, it, it could have been avoided. Uh, Macbeth uh, goes back and forth a couple of times. He decides not to not to kill Duncan, and and instead. Uh, Lady Macbeth manages to convince him. So um, the the idea of inevitability is often associated with tragedy, but I don't think that's really the point. Uh, it's interesting that you raised the uh, example of Thomas Hardy earlier, because you know, in naturalist fiction, inevitability indeed comes into play. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, even there, it's not exactly inevitable. I mean, it's not like a, but there is a very strong sense of the inevitable. Um, in many tragedies, uh, the striking thing is that there is no such sense of the inevitable. So in this respect, if the question had to do with the fact that Tiresias could have managed to convince Creon a little earlier, uh, it's true, but it doesn't really change the basic equation, I think. Okay, uh, one more question here. Uh, this is also about novels, I'm sorry to say. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but it has to do with tragedy as well. In modern novels, it, I would th so sorry, this is a question uh, by Ligia. She asks, in modern, uh, well, it's not really a question. I think it's more of a comment. And then uh, there's a question. In modern novels, we can think of words indicating many everyday actions, incredible flows of consciousness, but the tragedy is not the conflict with the enemy itself, but the world. And then she goes on. No longer the epic world. Words creates this world, but not actions. Uh, Professor Moretti, do you think that it would be some kind of tragedy? Do you think that it would be some kind of tragedy nowadays? I'm not sure uh, it's clear. Is it clear uh, to you? 
Mm. So, so, so uh, uh, no, not the final question. The final question I did not understand. Uh, what she says earlier, I think I uh, I do understand. I mean, it's uh, yeah. in tragedy, we always have the feeling of a character against other characters. There is really, a, uh, it's always uh, a human conflict. In the novel, and in this she's right, we, we very often, perhaps as, as a rule, have the feeling of a character in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some cases in which clearly the relationship with another character becomes essential, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, there is a much more, much broader sense that the most important uh, feelings are um, aroused not by a single other individual, but by a whole set of circumstances. And uh, this is conveyed by language and very often by the language of the narrator. So in that respect, uh, yeah, I, I actually agree. It's, uh, it's interesting. We, you know, in, in tragedy, uh, we can talk of the world of Antigone, I mean, meaning the system of characters, but we don't talk of the world. Whereas when we talk about novels, yes, it's easy to speak of the world and it's appropriate, it's right. I mean, the, the novel tries to create this sense of a whole world. Tragedy doesn't. It's really a much, uh, a much smaller structure. Well, the question I think, uh, I think as I understand it, is uh, do you think there would be not it would be, but there would be some kind of tragedy nowadays? I think she's still talking about the novel. There, I think. Yeah, there. Uh, you know, this yeah, tragedy as such has not really had uh, um, a great uh, life recently. Let's put it like that, and it's uh, part of my previous answer. So, yes, in principle there can be, but um, we don't see many of those happening, and. You know, the one of the most uh, striking uh, aspects is that uh, uh, very often um, some of the greatest tragedies, uh, in quotation marks, of our time, are they tragedies or are they comedies? I'm, I'm thinking of Beckett. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, waiting for Godot. Is it tragic? Right. Or... There's also a question about Beckett later on, so okay. you, you, we can now, develop well, that now. And the same for Chekhov. Is Chekhov tragic or comic? I mean, it's uh, it's really can be played in completely different ways. So that's that's how I see it. Okay, so uh, this is another. Uh, uh, well, it's a comment. It's more of a comment. No, there's a question as well, uh, because it starts with a comment and then uh, there's a question. Arthur asks. So he says there seems to be a tragic element in the plays by Beckett, Heine Müller. Alfred uh, Jelinek, but uh, there, in, in these plays, it seems that well, the, the uh, tragic element is uh, indissociable from comedy, and it, it, it depends on the end or the crisis uh, in drama. So thinking about that, um, wouldn't it be the case to think about the limit of uh, tragic drama as the uh, foundation for contemporary tragedy. This is what it seems uh, Christoph, uh, Christoph, I don't know, Mank seems to propose in conversation with Zondi, but also in conversation with post-dramatic theater. I'm sorry about my translation, but you know, it's- <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm trying no. to cope with the, uh, I don't know if that was clear. Yeah, yeah, it was clear, and uh, this is someone who clearly knows a lot about tragedy and tragic theory because uh, Menke is, uh, uh, yeah, is uh, is someone who's written some uh, uh, striking things about tragedy and about Beckett. Indeed, um, is a very uh, like different from me, but like me, uh, strongly inspired by Hegel and Hegel's theory. And um, uh, 
Yeah, I am not sure that the ending itself is enough to change the meaning. As, as, as at least as I see it now, clearly, uh, very often we have situations that could end in completely different ways, and then whether you end it in one way or another changes the meaning of the whole. But at least in the way I look at tragedy, this um, seems to belong more to the general uh, idea of the accident than of the decision that I've tried to put at the center of tragic uh, conflict today. So um, I see the possibility and it's true that it has been used by playwrights and uh, uh, indeed it has been used by uh, playwrights not only in the 20th century. Goethe himself uh, had a play, Stella, a comedy for lovers, uh, which had an ending, which was a happy ending, and then he returned to it years later, and it ends in tragedy and madness. But uh, this is um, um, a dollhouse, a lot of, a lot, several people wrote sequels to Doll's House with, uh, you know, uh, which turned it into a proper tragedy or into a proper comedy. Um, I think that when everything hinges on the end, the most interesting solution is indeed the one Ibsen used for a doll's house or which Brecht used in a different way in, uh, in his plays. That is to say, to end the play on ambiguity rather than cut the knot at the very end. But, but it is something that, uh, that often happens. And uh, I haven't thought about this much. This is, I'm improvising the answer, of course. And uh, indeed, it's a phenomenon that it's uh, interesting to think about this, the possibility of different endings. Uh, we know that Ibsen, when he was writing a dollhouse initially, was thinking of having Nora kill herself, like Hedda Gabler does in a later play. So it's even in the mind of uh, playwrights, this is an active possibility. Is that okay? Wow. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I think we have actually uh, taken a lot of your time. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation, for taking all those questions and I think we are looking forward. Is this going to be a book? Eh, hey, but God knows when, God knows when. This is <laughs> cha the only chapter of a book that I will write to, would like to write, but who knows? <laughs> Right. Well, uh, Arthur, Arthur uh, uh, says that he doesn't want to monopolize, but I think there's a footnote here as well. He doesn't want to monopolize, but uh, he wants to, to, to just to clarify that he was not talking about the end in the sense of denouement or an ending, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, in, 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 in how um, plays end. But at the end of the uh, of drama in the historical sense, he's, talk he's actually oh. talk he's referring to Zondi. The, 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 the Christ yeah, yeah, again, zombie, yeah. yeah, sorry, yeah. Right? if you can just perhaps finish on that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so um, I think we have to thank you. There are lots of, uh, again, lots of comments here. Thanking you for, uh, for, for your lecture. Um, you. Um, you are the one who had the idea. Yeah, I know, but I mean, you are the one who accepted. <laughs> <laughs> you are the one who has taken your time to, to, to be with us. And it's been a real pleasure. And I must say, I must confess that uh, it's been a pleasure to see you again after Same all these for years. Same for and uh, we look forward to your uh, uh, other lecture in the second semester. And all those people asking about novels here, uh, there were some questions about novels, and I'm asking them to wait until yeah. you come again 
and talk to us again next semester. Okay. But let, let me warn you. Let me warn you. I will talk about novels that almost no one has read. Has nowadays. read or has heard they about. They read them two hundred years ago. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, but anyway, I mean, there's always you, you are always sort of uh, finding uh, new things about these uh, old things, so it's it's fine. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that, so I hope uh, everybody else yeah. is as well. But you know, words like excellent, fantastic, thanks a lot, Professor Moretti. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, well, and, and and all that. So we are really, really, really happy to have you here. So am I. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> and I hope your cat is fine now. And um, a hug to everybody in the family, to Kai and Terry, and a big hug to you. Thank you. Same Abraccio, you. grazie tantissime. <laughs> ciao, ciao, ciao. Bye -bye. Ciao.